Hello again, my dear students, and welcome to a new chapter. Actually, it's not a big chapter. It's a small chapter related to what's called sensor interfacing circuits. In the previous sections, we have considered different blocks building a soft power sensor. For example, we have considered the sensor itself, the solid state physics beyond the sensor, and we have considered different examples of that. We have considered the energy management, how we can calculate the energy consumed by the sensor and actually how we can control the sleep mode, the active mode and all this stuff. We have also considered the DC-DC converting sense, uh, circuit and we will maybe understand today the critical part of why we need a DC-DC converter. And now we are going to consider another two important blocks in this self power sensor. The first is the interfacing circuit. And the second is a very diluted view on the energy harvesting techniques. Okay, so let me now start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I hope you can now see my uh, presentation slides. That's great. So as I mentioned, our topic today is interfacing circuits. The first question may comes to why sensor needs an interfacing circuit. Actually, there is more than one reason for a sensor to need an interfacing circuit. Maybe the most common reason is that usually, the voltage or the current generated from a sensor, as we know, a sensor is a device that converts a physical phenomena into some electrical parameter, which can be current, resistance, voltage, whatever. Most likely, the voltage need the voltage. So, as I mentioned, maybe the first reason is that the voltage or the current generated from these sensing pulses is usually very low maybe in the micro or the milli range. That's why we need to somehow amplify this voltage so that we can have a voltage that can be processed by our digital signal through an ADC or analog digital converter. But this is, this is not the only reason for having interfacing circuits. We can have interfacing circuits for other reasons as well. So another reasons for having interfacing circuits may be, for example, getting rid from high frequency noise by using a low-pass filter or preventing any loading effect through using a buffer or having some sort of filtering, high or low-pass filtering requirements using a CMOS-based filter or maybe using some sort of edge bridging resistance network. In the, coming, in the coming slides, we are going to demonstrate some examples to clarify how we can make a very simple interfacing circuits. So, for example, here we have what's called a side raster. Maybe you, you already know something about side raster or not, but simply speaking, side raster is a, some sort of a sensor that convert the, the temperature into a resistance. Usually we call it a negative trans trans uh, temperature coefficient thyrester because as you can see from this graph, by increasing the temperature, the value of the resistance decreases. That's why we call it a negative temperature coefficient. What we can do very simply in order to have an interfacing circuit for this thyrester is simply speaking, considering a potential divider network between R1 and R2 over a certain supply Vs. So simply speaking, as you can see here, the output voltage, which represents the variation due to temperature, will be equals to R2 over R1 plus R2 times the Vs, which is a constant. As you can see, my dear student, from this relation that the main variable here is R2. So by changing R2, the overall value of the output voltage will change. You can consider this in an example 
when we have a constant supply of 12 voltage and R1 of, uh, or sorry, and R2, I'm sorry, R1 is a variable, not R2. So R2 is a fixed with one kilo ohm and R1 will have an one, a 10 kilo ohm at 25 degrees Celsius and 100 ohm at, at 100 degrees Celsius. So simply speaking, you can now calculate the value of the output uh, voltage per change in the temperature degree, as you can see here. So, for example, at, degree, at 25 degrees Celsius, your output voltage will be equivalent to about 1.09 voltage, while this voltage will increase to 10.9 voltage by having a 100 degrees Celsius temperature. Of course, maybe you can now ask yourself a question, why we need this pattern? Just return back to our previous lecture when we co when we consider CMOS technology using operational amplifier and switching capacitance and so on. And we have already discussed a lot about operational amplifiers. And you can easily know that this buffer has a very important added value for a network because simply speaking, the output resistance seen now by your sensor is nearly zero. As you know, ideally, the, 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 the output resistance for an operational amplifier is equal to zero. That means that you now ignore any loading effect between this stage and the next stage, which most likely will be an ADC, an electrical converter or whatever. So this is another or as a simple circuit to demonstrate how we can implement a thyristor in an interfacing circuit. Another interesting circuit is related to what we can call a push push buttons or on off or what maybe we can consider it, a digital sensors. A digital sensor or an off on off sensors are these sensors that be make a very uh, a, a, a very big, a very big variation in the conditions between either having a high value or a low value or either on or off. So for example here we have a a sensing process in terms of a push button. So this sensor is either an on or off. Is this is either a short circuit or an open circuit? So to make it or to convert this into a voltage, this is quite easy, as you can see. So now, if we connect another another resistance, this higher higher resistance, with let me. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I have to make out my. There's a pointer in front, sorry about that. Okay, so if we connect this uh, this switch with a, a resistance on the supply, simply speaking, if this is a short circuit, then your output voltage will drop into zero. Once this is an open circuit, then you will get some voltage provided from the supply through the resistance. So you have some, something like a square wave or an up, up, on up output signal coming out from your sensor. Here, as you can see, my dear students, this is a very simple on up circuit. However, this circuit has some annoying effect, which we call it the switch bunch effects or the bunching effect. What is the bunching effect or this switching effect? It's actually related to your basic understanding to the Fourier analysis and Fourier series. If you remember, my dear students, whenever we have these sharp edges in a signal, these sharp edges indicates what we can call a high frequency component. And usually, whenever you make any sort of a, signal, a, um, a circuit, you, your circuit has some sort of a limited bandwidth. That simply means that it allows some frequencies and reject other frequencies. So, considering that, Usually, what you are going to get from your sensor is not a very clear, sharp signal, as you can see here, but some fluctuating high frequency noises related to the filtering effect included in your circuit. And this, we, what we can call the bunching effect. So, how we can reduce this bunching effect? There's actually more than one technique for that to reduce the bunching effect. One of these techniques is, so one of these techniques that we can use to compensate this bunching effect is using this capacitor. So simply speaking, 
if this circuit is open circuit, if this switch is an open circuit, the, the capacitor is going to charge to its full capacity. Once the capacitor, uh, once the, the circuit is in short circuit, then automatically what, what will happen is that the capacitor will discharge this. Now, you can control the time of charging and discharging as this time of charging and discharging is simply equals to C times R plus R1 plus R2. So, you can make that this constant charge time is longer than the punching time so that you can make the charging and the charging process and avoid any bunching or high frequency ripples that can appear here and there, as you can see, by using this capacitor. So this is one of the techniques we can use to get rid of these punching effects. Another circuit related to the photodiodes, as you can see here, where we have a photodiode, as you know, maybe from, uh, if you study somewhere of uh, the photodiode technology, you know that the light is directly proportional into the current. So the higher the light intensity, the higher the, the current. And here you have an associated capacitor. So for example, here, the photodiode capacitor is about 25 picofarad. So in order to get rid of any high frequency noise, what we are using here simply is that we are using a high uh, sorry, a low pass filter associated to this uh, to this uh, circuit. So as you can, oh, as you already know from your operational amplifier classes, that there is no current, ideally there is no current coming inside. So you are transferring only the voltage assuming an in, in, in finite input resistance and again a zero output resistance. And this is some sort of a having a low pass filter effect with, uh, to reject high frequency noise from your photo that. So all these are examples or very actually a very um, amateur examples of having interfacing circuits that can be used to interface the sensor. As I mentioned earlier, this interfacing circuit can be either for magnifying the power of the current and voltage getting from the, uh, the circuit or the sensor or it can be for neglect or rejecting high frequency noises, or it can be for making a buffering stage to isolate the output is the next stage with respect to the sensing stage and to avoid any loading effect. So this is a very simple example for that. The second issue is related to what we can call an energy harvester. Energy harvesters is a very important and a basic block whenever you consider what's called a self-powered sensors. Because the concept of a self-powered sensors is related to getting, capturing, or harvesting energy from some external sources to be fed to your sensor. As we already demonstrated in our previous chapters, that active or smart sensors needs some sort of energy between quotations power to be operated. So the role of this energy harvester is to harvest or produce the needed amount of energy. So whenever we consider an energy harvester, we have first to consider a very important parameter related to the energy harvester, which is the energy budget. What is an energy budget? So energy budget is the process of equalizing the energy produced to the energy consumed. I think in the energy management lecture, we have already discussed together how we can estimate the energy to be operated by a sensor. And the question is now, how we can capture, how we can harvest this energy? As I just mentioned, our, our solution will be toward energy harvesting. So energy harvesting can take many alternatives, including, for example, using vibrations or pressures 
with the aid of a piezoelectrical material using light, either a solar or an indoor artificial lighting or a diffuse lighting with the aid of a light resistors, using temperature difference with the aid of a thermoelectrical materials, and so on. Maybe it's not a concrete part of this course is to consider the sources of energy harvesters and the mechanism beyond the harvesting. I would recommend for those who are interested for that to visit my course with an energy harvesting systems to know more about that. But here we are just considering energy harvesters as a black box. And what should be the output of these black box? Usually, the output of this black box is what we call the energy density, or how, sorry, I'm sorry, not the energy, the power density. How much power I'm going to ex extract per unit area of this harvester. So for example, as you can see here, this is a vibrator, most likely using a piezoelectric material, and due to some vibrations, we can extract it's a human or an industrial, you can extract, for example, 100 watt, microwatt per centimeter square. So what you are going to do here, my dear students, is you will start to make your energy budget. For example, okay, I need, uh, let's say, for example, I need to have 1000 watt hour to operate my sensor per day. So the energy needed per day is 1,000 watt hour or one, one kilowatt hour per day. So that's mean that if I use this sensor with an area of one centimeter square, I will get 100. So I'm sorry, I, 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 I mentioned a wrong, a wrong example. What I, I, I intended to say that I need 1,000 microwatt hour per day, not 1,000 watt hour per day. So if I need, or if if my demand, let me use here the annotation. So if my demand is 1,000 micro watt per micro watt hour, Per day, I need to to gain my in order to operate my sensors. I need to one thousand microwatt uh, uh, hour per day. This is the energy needed, so it's one milliwatt hour per day. If, for example, again, this is just a very trivial example. So, if this the if if this represents the energy needed by the uh, uh, by the harvester, uh, or sorry, by the sensor, then if I'm going to use this sensor, if I'm going to use this sensor, this one, which with one 100 micro watt per minute centimeter square, and let's say that the area you, I'm using this sensor is, for example, one centimeter square, so typically I get 100 micro watt, then I have to have this energy source operating continuously for 10 hours. So 10 times 100, it gives 1,000 microwatt hour per day. This is a very basic principle of how we can see or how we can consider what's called the energy budget. So an energy budget here represents mainly the compensation or the equalization between the energy I gained and the energy I'm consuming. As you see, or as you observe from this example, we have here two important adjusting parameters related to the energy harvesting block, regardless its type, either it's a piezoelectrical light or thermoelectrical or whatever. The first is the expected working hours or the expected harvesting hours. And this is a very critical parameter related to the energy gained. For example, in solar light harvesters, we have what's called the peaks and hours. When we consider a light harvester due to a solar radiation, these peaks and hours varies from one location to another and varies from 
one day in the year or seasonally from a season to another. For example, in our case in Egypt, we have our peaks and hours of variation varying from 4.5 hours to 5.5 hours per day. So if you go to this light harvester, for example, in the uh, outdoor light harvester, with 10 milliwatt per centimeter square, let's take this example, in average in Egypt, this 10 milliwatt per centimeter square will give you, we will multiply it by five, so it will give you 50 milliwatt hour per centimeter square per day. So here I convert what we can call a power density, which is a power per unit area, into what we can call an energy density, which is an energy per unit area. Okay, so the first important parameter is the harvesting hours or the harvesting time in general. As you can see, in most of the cases, this harvesting time or this harvesting interval is not under your control. So for example, in case of a solar harvesters, this is not part of your job. It depends on your location on the earth and your season. And then you can calculate the equivalent number of peaks and hours. Simply, if you are gaining some extra heat lo losses from a motor or from a HVAC or whatever, you are not going to control this delta T in terms of a value or in terms of, of a time. So if you are attaching a thermoelectrical material in an HVAC system, an air conditioning system, and then you get, you get um, this extra heat to be turned into an, uh, 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 an, ex an extra energy harvested, uh, harvesting energy. So you are not controlling the working hours of this HVAC system. This is demand on the building or whatever it is. So this is not highly considered as a design parameter. However, it's considered as a critical parameter in the system to be considered, of course. The second design and important parameter is the area. As you can see across all these numbers, here we are considering what's called the power dynasty or the power extracted per unit area. This power dynasty will differ from one application to another depending on how much area you are going to use your harvesters. Again, this is a design parameter, yes, but it's not an unlimited parameter because usually in sensors, especially in wild sensor networks, or wild sensor networks nodes, I mean, your available area is usually limited. So, okay, it's a design parameter principally, but you still have restriction related to the area of the node or whatever. So again, this is another important parameter you have to consider how to maximize the area to be harvested, because basically when you maximize the area to be harvested, you maximize the power and the energy to be harvested. Another important aspect actually related to this thermoelectrical harvesters, it's what's called then, of course, this is efficiency, but here I will go to, yes, here, <clears throat> what's called, <clears throat> sorry, the operating voltage and current. Usually, you are not controlling this operating voltage and current. The operating voltage and, cur and current are part of the specs related to the harvester. So, for example, I get some light harvester that gives its maximum efficiency when the voltage is equal to 3 voltage and the current is equal to 100 milliampere. And basically, most of the cases, your sensor will need another operating voltage and current. For example, my solar cell or my large harvesters gives me three voltage, but I'm working on 4.8 voltage in my sensor. Herein, the role of the dc dc converters play a very critical function in your circuit. If you remember, my dear students, we have considered that one of the main advantages of this DC DC converter, not only to rectify the, the DC signal from any external fluctuations coming from environmental changes or whatever in your harvester, but also to step up or what's called boost or to step down or what's called back your voltage, depending on your need. 
So if you are gaining three voltage from your harvester and you would like to make it to 4.8 voltage uh, to, to operate your sensor, simply you need a boost converter to boost your voltage from three to 4.8. But simply please take care and please remember the, the law of conservation of power. This boosting in your voltage will back your current. So whenever you boost your voltage from three to 4.8, you are going to back your current with the same ratio. So you have to manage those to match your operating system or your operating uh, voltage and current. So by this, as I mentioned previously, I'm not going to investigate deeply into the main process toward uh, having a energy harvesting, because as I mentioned, this is part of another course under the title of energy harvesting system. You can check this course whenever you need, but I'm just linking blocks. So in our case, what we are going to do is simply you are going to have some sort of this table, for example. So you just pick up a voltage, uh, sorry, a, a certain harvesting source and take the numbers, which is typically the power dynasty, the operating hours, the working uh, operating voltage and current, and then you can manage to have your energy harvesting but or your energy budget of a sensor to match the energy supplied by the energy concept. This is simply what we are going to do. Okay, so that's all for this small chapter considering interfacing circuit and principles of managing energy budget for from an energy harvester. Thank you very much, my dear students. In the next chapters, we are going to have two new topics. First, a macroscopic topic considering a complete sensor node. So we are going to play with that. And then we are going to consider wireless communications. Wireless communications, either in terms of data transmission, how the node is going to transmit its data to other central nodes to communicate together, and also wireless communication in another aspect, which is a very challenging aspect, how you can charge your uh, node wirelessly. So thank you very much for your concentration and see you next lecture.